This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. I'm going to remind myself to bring a can of oil next week for that door. It kind of uh, really announces itself. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, lovely to um, see you all. There's more of you here this week. That's good. I don't know what happened week three. Down a bit in numbers. Um, so, what are we doing? Um, so last week it was um, not quite as planned, but I think it still went pretty well. It was pretty much the Professor Terry Burke show. Um, but Terry has heaps to kind of offer and share, and um, um, I hope you found that useful. And I certainly found it useful. Every time I hear Terry, I learn things and I kind of go, I need to understand that a bit more, or I need to include um, some of that thinking into uh, my practice, so uh, and uh, so we might be kind of going back a bit to, uh, especially Terry's kind of updated model that he uh, shared with us this week, because I've been using his old model, which just has four parts, but he's now made it much bigger. But uh, we might kind of have a have a look at that again, and maybe look at it as against a particular kind of uh, emerging housing typology, which is. Uh, Built to rent. So, where are we week four? Um, one of the things in the subject guide, I'm not covering this week because I reckon Terry covered it pretty well last week, which is, which is uh, understanding market failure and housing. Um, I mean, there's plenty in the readings for that, but I'm, I'm just not going to go into to detail on that at this point. Um, what we're going to do this week is... We're going to talk about financialization, um, and then we're going to talk about when we're when we're looking at housing, and we're looking at housing for everybody. The problems of financialization and the impacts of financialization. Um, so I'm going to be talking through that a little bit. I am going to. I feel it's a bit cheating, but it's so good. I am going to show you a TED talk, but it's a really good one, um, which I think kind of really brings it together. So hopefully, uh, you'll agree with me when, when, once you once you once you see it. But uh, I hope you haven't seen it. It's kind of like it's got thirty eight thousand views, which is really low for a TED talk. So I'm, I'm just trying to get more people to see it. It's very good. Um, after the break, we'll. Have a look at, we'll kind of get, get maybe into the detail of, of affordable housing, housing affordability. Was, I want to kind of get a bit technical at this point because it, it, it's pretty important that we start to look at the kind of mechanics and of um, research and the application of research into policy of um, ideas about affordable housing. So um, I'm going to... 
you've got, a, a, I think, a, a very good paper this week, the, the Baker et al. paper. Um, I'll be referring to that, but what I'm going to, I'm going to bring in a couple of uh, just examples from my own work in, um, in Moreland Council that we've been doing with that in terms of that question of how do you measure housing need? How do you know what's actually, um, what the problem is or where the problem is most profound? Um, and if I time everything right, we'll have time to talk a little bit about build to rent. Um, and that's, this is really kind of a bit, bit exploratory at this point, but, and, and um, might even involve some uh, room participation. I'm uh, hopeful for that, but I thought it might, uh, at the point, seem to apply some of the concepts we've been dealing with today and previous weeks into this thing, which is the, um, the big deal at the moment, kind of in, in, in a lot of spaces in terms of uh, uh, being presented as a, uh, a hope for Australia and maybe other places, but certainly Australia in terms of dealing with some of the chronic housing problems we have. And uh, we'll, uh, maybe we'll start to take a bit of a critical eye on that and see what, see what we think. And it might be one you're thinking about for your assignments as well, but don't everybody do build some rent? You, know, you can work that out with your tutors. First of all, financialization. Um, what is financialization? Well, first and foremost, I see kind of when it's kind of mentioned in kind of general discussion, it's often kind of put together with neoliberalism. You may have heard of neoliberalism, people talk about that a lot. Um, it's not neoliberalism, um, but interesting enough, a part of the reason they get talked a lot about together is almost the kind of, I guess they, when they've started to, ex to kind of exist and kind of matter in the world, it's been about the same time. It all started around 1980, really, in terms of the, both the, the big neoliberal project and the process of financialization. But if you look at kind of neoliberalism, it's, it's, it's an ideology about free market competition and kind of small government. Right, so it's about, it is about markets, and financialization, so it's about markets, and it's about small government. Um, the best way I would say to see the relationship is that they, they do have an interplay relationship, in, in that um, certainly neoliberal ideology and that impact on kind of public, public policy and systems from the kind of early 1980s has created an environment by which financialization has, you know, grown and, and, and flourished. And at the same time, the out the kind of the what has happened with financialization, what what systems and processes and and huge amounts of money that have been created by financialization have then fed into kind of the, the neoliberal project in terms of public policy. And they've kind of been used as a justification. You know, why should governments borrow money when there's all this other money that we can get from the market? You know, what's the problem? Well, let's, let's look at that. The other thing to, in terms of kind of, uh, you know, the, the terminology and or to use is, is financialization is also often used in the, in the same kind of breath as globalization. And um, again, there's a strong interplay between them. But um, globalization is, um, is about the movement of, of, of goods and services. I mean, it's an idea about goods, services, and capital, which obviously involves kind of uh, connects to financialization as well. But um, the concept of globalization is, is an idea whether it actually what happens or not is another case, an idea of interdependence. And um, I don't think the idea of the concept of interdependence really works when you're talking about financialization. It's 
caught up going somewhere else entirely. So, what is financialization? Now, some of you may all know this. This is, you know, what's this got to do with housing? Well, I don't, I'm not going to assume you kind of all know this or kind of understand this. And I think it's important that we look at financial, you know, understand the broad kind of thing that is financialization before we look at, look at it in relation to housing. So even if you're familiar with it, hey, this is a refresher. Um, so you've got um, a frequently used definition up there by, by um, um, Greta Kuttner, who's um, written some really kind of solid pieces on that in, in, in UCLA. Um, a pattern of accumulation in which profit making occurs increasingly through financial channels rather than through trade and commodity production. So, what we have, what, what we're talking about here is, I guess, stuff and not stuff, all right? Stuff is like, you know, widgets. Things that you can look at, tangible kind of things, even tangible assets like, like kind of individual buildings that have, that have value. Or maybe have like, often if you're, you know, done one-on-one -on -one accounting, they have depreciating value and there's a whole kind of lot of stuff around that. And that's, you know, right from Adam Smith, right the way through, right through Marx, because he was all about the material stuff, all of that stuff. It's all like things and labor, labor, real people doing real things and all of that. So that's the idea of the market. And that was the primary kind of function of banks was to support that kind of activity. Right up until, um, right up until the kind of uh, certainly, and we're looking at probably later into the 80s. That's what they were doing, and they were primarily lending to business. So, one of the reasons that financialization could happen is technology. You cannot do what financialization does without computing power. So actually, it, it, the, the technological driver is really, really significant. Um, and it's important to kind of remember that in terms of the drivers of technology, um, probably second only to the, the military, it was the banking system that really drove computer technology and, and the, the, the improvements in, in computer technology through the kind of post post Second World War period. Obviously, you know, the military were kind of doing it as well, but it was the, um, I'm just recalling, I, I, had a, I had a friend kind of in the, in the, probably in the early 90s who had a job kind of caretaking um, a big bank in Ireland's um, computer center. And it was like a huge building floors and floors and floors with those things that go round and all of that. There was, and it was a great big modernist, like actually lovely modernist building um, in Dublin. And it was like a really significant kind of place. You know, computing and banks were like, you know, they, they were the ones that do it. It was the first place you saw computers. Ordinary people first saw computers usually in banks. Right, so there was, there was this underlying technological driver technological driver, but things, you know, um, what, what we're looking at as well, um, a real shift in what was happening with computing technology at that period as well. You know, we're looking at, you know, the growth of microcomputing, um, Bill Gates, um, that Apple guy, Steve Jobs, that's right, um, all of that. So all of that was happening as well. So the other part of, of the Technology solution was the creation of the financial analyst. And this is a different kind of breed of human than your kind of stock exchange kind of person. This is a whole different, working at a whole kind of different kind of level and not working necessarily physically in a 
exchange where people go and have this and this and this, like like uh, you might see. This is this is actually this virtualization happening in terms of space as well, the flow of data. So no, go away. Um, so what um, what we see kind of happening, um, and I'll just, hopefully this video will work. It might be a little bit quiet, this one. The second one's better. Um, makers and takers is a, it's a good kind of populist read. It's not a hard read. It's, it, it's a, um, Rana Furaha's book, uh, she's a uh, journalist, I think, with uh, the Times, I think, uh, I think Time magazine. Um, but she actually really did this survey of what, what kind of happened um, after the global financial crisis and, and kind of then kind of really pulled the narrative back to kind of, you know, where this all started and the fact that there was a kind of bit of a mythology that things had really changed, that this because financialization was often blamed for the, the global financial crisis and that, well, everybody learned their lesson. And this book is kind of very important in terms of actually showing, well, um, it didn't change very much at all. So I'll just show you this small clip and then we'll talk a bit more on numbers. That's later. Talking to a lot of business people who are not in finance about that. That's and very saying, low. Do you realize your bankers are taking a quarter of all the private sector profits? And their reaction? Two reactions. If they are private uh, and or sort of small businesses makers, they tend to be stunned, outraged, you know, say, yeah, that's why we've always self-financed. We never want to do a lot. But interestingly, corporations that are public tend to be part of that whole process because if you think about it, CEOs get anywhere from 30 to 80 percent of their pay in stock options. So they play the market game. They play the let's push up our share price in these kind of fake ways, quarter by quarter. Let's buy a bunch of our shares back and, you know, and do, do these sort of, you know, en financial engineering things to raise the share price. Because guess what? My bonus is going to be bigger. We have a, a system of incentives that is pushing everybody in exactly the wrong direction. So in the States, and, you know, I think in the UK as well, we have a conversation now about should stock options be how people get most of their pay um, buybacks? You know, they were illegal before 1982. They were more Market manipulation. You know? Charlie Munger says, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Indeed. So we shouldn't be shocked. No, we shouldn't be shocked. Finance is a complex system. And so there's no one silver bullet. So you have to look at all these different areas. You have to look at the tax code. You have to look at housing policy. You have to look at um, the way financial regulation is structured. But these things can be boiled down. And I would boil it down and say, we should ask the financial sector, what are you doing? For all the numbers you can generate, generate a number that shows what you're doing for Main Street, what you're doing to make people wealthier, and keep doing that, and then everything else you're doing, let's make it go away. Right. So that's Rana Forhar calling for, you know, a more kindly capitalism, to be quite honest. Um, but what she's bringing up there, and I'll keep kind of looping back into these themes, as well as is a kind of institutional kind of co corruption in in within financialization uh, and a, a with the because what's happened is that that the nature of um with this creation of money essentially out of nothing but not out of nothing out of essentially uh what they call um uh Ex yeah, but also, the, yeah, it had the words like exotic products, like derivatives were exotic products. And that, that they were like, people were dreaming up ways in which you could kind of create these new products out, out, out of nothing. Um, they were worth, so 2006, before the crash, derivatives, which were, everybody know kind of generally what a derivative is? <coughs> So it's when you don't trade the thing, you trade what you think might happen with the thing, right? So it's, it, it, it's, it's trading based on 
um, not the actual um, entity itself, but the movement of the entity, up or down. Spinning stops. So it's like roulette, red or black. Yeah. Stops. It's red or black. It's red or black, but it's like the what's actually happening physically doesn't matter. It's kind of like it's it's an observed thing. Um, I won't. I mean, I'm not. It's not my strong point of get. I. Um, I literally, my brain hurt. I have a, one of my oldest, dearest friends ended up being, um, started off as a lawyer and then ended up in, in Credit Suisse and being one of these people who kind of created these things. And, and I, I honestly, my brain just exploded when he tried to explain to me what they were doing because, and this is, and especially after the crash, because he kind of explained to me, yeah, you would not believe what we got away with. So 2006, you had $1,200 trillion US dollars of derivatives valuation at the time when the global co economy was only worth $50 trillion. All right, so think about that. So the GDP is $50 trillion, but there's all this by multiple of you know, you work it out, 2,400 or whatever. Um, is actually being traded, moving around. So this is the, and within that, what you have is. You're trading something that's not there and you don't have. Um. Yes, but but it it does then end up relating back to real right. world economics, and what we've. Um, what, it, what it's done in terms of global corporations is, it's really, well, we hear all the time, every time you hear business reports, business discussion, it's about shareholder value. I mean, shareholder value has always been important. That's the basis of kind of the kind of the, the company system, the organization of um, most kind of capitalist systems is about, you know, entities which have shareholders that need, need to be, um, paid or given a dividend, etc. But before financialization, market share mattered, volume of sales mattered. These other kind of basic concepts of operating kind of businesses and trade and whatever mattered a lot as well. But what you saw happen with, seen happen with financialization is those things matter less and less because value can be created, wealth and money can be created outside of actual physical production of products, physical trade. Um, and I guess the only other th really thing to kind of take away from it as well is that it's not understandable. If you've done any kind of, ever looked in any kind of complexity theory, you know, the idea is you can't actually fully understand it. It's too complex to ever understand it. You can only try to kind of look at one part of it at a particular point in time and understand what parts are working. But the system is so complex, it's very difficult to understand, which presents a huge challenge to policymakers. You know, it's kind of elusive. The other side of it is, it's very, very powerful in terms of the narrative of, of financialization, this creation of wealth, this amount of money available. And that's been part of the, to go back to the neo neoliberalism, they've been part of the narrative of privatization. Um, well, yeah, the world, um... So you're never doing wrong as a policy officer, really. <laughs> um, 
In terms of, I, I think there's a, you can look, part of the way to look at it is the, even if governments haven't got smaller, and we can talk about whether governments have got smaller or not in kind of as many ways to look at it, possibly, you know, national governments will have got weaker in the face of this. So, yes. I think um, the, and I'm not going to go off, because remember, I'm not an economist, so I'm, I'm going to stay within my knowledge, you know, but it used to be much more important fiscal policy. I put John Maynard Keynes up there. If you're not familiar with Keynes, sorry, somebody in my generation totally is, because Keynesianism was the kind of bedrock of, of um, I guess, liberal democracies for sure, in, in or, or Western kind of democracies right from the post-war period in, until the 80s. You know, Keynes developed his theories um, in, in the 30s, English guy. Essentially, it was, um, it was an idea of the, that the state, is, the state is there to create, um, you know, the good conditions for a capitalist economy to, to, to work. And a key part of the state's role is essentially to um, turn taps on and off in terms of actually kind of um, money. You know, it, the state can regulate the economy, balance out what was then very simplistic in terms of trade versus inflation versus, you know, wage growth with, you know, using its power with money. Um, and that was the, the Chicago School of Economics, kind of Milton Friedman and all those people, um, basically, you know, went, no, nah, we don't like this at all. Government is basically bad, and government shouldn't have that role. So there's that kind of interplay there. Um, so what does that mean here in Australia? I put this up, um, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it was a question about what's Basel. Um, that is the, I keep forgetting how it's termed, what's called, the Basel Committee on Bank Supervision Building in Basel, which is a lovely little city just in the kind of border with Germany and Switzerland. If you ever go there, it's got a big. Uh, has it got a casino? I think it's got a big casino there as well, which is kind of funny. Um, I think the building itself was almost kind of, you know, representative of um, a number of things. Um, Basel I, there's been three kind of Basel agreements, and I say they've been kind of these worldwide agreements around the interplay. They, they, they basically govern what's happening between, you know, all banks are still have national kind of national jurisdiction kind of imposed upon them, but they, so they need terms of trade, almost like just like a post system needs kind of terms of trade and how things work. So what what Basel one did was um, there's been a couple since then, and I won't go into kind of what they've done. To be honest, I don't completely understand. But essentially, what Basel one did and this is where it comes into important for housing, is said, banks, you don't have to, you can, your risk profile's far too conservative in relation to housing. You can actually keep a lot less liquidity, cash, or virtual cash, on the books in relation to things like mortgages. I mean, you got all this, you're doing all this work with business, you could, you know, there's an opportunity here. You know, housing's good. Housing's a good asset. You should get into it. Um, and that's really important the rest is history. So that's the Australian kind of story in terms of um, how much mortgages related to um, GDP. But I guess what I want to do, kind of talk about in relation to this part of this impact of financialization and, and the creating of um, 
the ch changing of banks and national banks in terms of um, uh, how they were getting their money and what they were doing with their money was the, the narrative is, but this has created lots of wealth. So it's easier to get a mortgage, it's easier to get into the market and then have your asset and the asset drives wealth. And when we have a, what's um, euphemistically called a correction, which apparently we're just at the end of, the correction that started in mid-2017 uh, in the Australian housing market, then you get headlines like this, which is only from last month, in the, um, in the Australian Financial Review. And I guess what I wanted to kind of put into your mind is to think kind of sceptically about these kind of headlines and what they actually really mean for most people. Um, and part of the reason for that is, well, look at the stats. Um, is it wealth or is it debt? And what it's looking at here, even within since 2003, is this is the, the debt burden. So the OECD has a kind of measure of burden of debt, you know, um, way to measure that, and the ABS kind of collects it. And if you look at the um, property, total property loans, it's, um, so what is it? That is a hundred and, It's risen quite significantly. What is it called? Yeah. It, I would say it's almost double. But what the, um, the other part of this kind of work that the ABS does is says, um, how many people are the OECD measures, how many people are over, <coughs> over indebted? by measure, an OECD measure across all the OECD countries. And it finds 27% um, of Australian households are actually over-indebted by an international standard um, by, by 2016. So, this is income going up, this is asset value, and this is debt. So, for many ordinary people, um, they are, there appears to be a benefit from financialization. A benefit for, and, and Terry talked quite a bit and more eloquently to me about this last week, about all this money that's at such a low percentage in terms of interest rates, etc., even going into kind of almost negative at some points. But it's, it, it is really, really low at the moment. Um, but is it actually doing the thing that people expect, many people expect it to do in terms of actually home ownership? Is it actually building wealth? Um, in the Alba's reading this week, which I'm sure you've all read by now, um, he gives an example of uh, a very kind of simplistic example. I think it's quite effective. He talks about a couple. They would like to have right now a $400,000 home in the market. They can't afford to get that. They can afford to get a buy a $200,000 home. That's that's the loan they get. That's the loan they can afford. But they wait five years, and look what happens. The market rises. It rises 50% over five years. It's worth $300,000 five years later. Well, that's great. They've got $100,000 of equity. And that's, you know, that's the idea, isn't it, of home ownership? you now got this equity and stepping stone. Now what can you do with it? 
but their $400,000 home that they wanted five years before has also grown by 50%. So now, it costs $600,000. So even with that $100,000 deposit, they've got to get a half million dollar loan. Now they might do that, a bank might give that to them, but they also might not because that's actually maybe the payments on that will make, make their, you know, make, make, put them into housing stress, which we'll talk about a bit later. So Albers kind of, you know, really points to that and kind of says, think about the, the implications of this. Think about the implications of this for that, you know, hypothetical family. Um, they might have moved to a flat, this 200 grand flat, in a less, less serviced area, well serviced area, maybe a little bit out, doesn't have such good public transport, doesn't have nice coffee and cheese in the, you know, down the road. But it's, it's only for a few years. We're gonna get back in. We're gonna get back into Brunswick. And we're gonna get back into, I don't know, Albert Park or Camberwell or wherever. Um, but do they? And maybe they do, but are they actually building wealth? Or are they building up more debt? So this is, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more, this is part of the critique of financialization and this, this driver of financial, the key thing that's been identified as the impact of financialization, which is this inflationary effect on housing because that's where, um, that's where a lot of the money has gone. It's gone, in, it's gone into housing, it hasn't gone into production, it's gone into housing assets, but then it goes into housing, creating housing products. So it's not even the individual housing. And Albus does talk about that, but he talks about, you know, um, you still might want to have a place to live, though. You can move to a supermarket. Yeah. Do you want to, though? Do you want Why? to? Why? Yeah. Mm. It, it's up to you, mm. but yeah. again, it is undeniable that your, your assets is the cost of money. Ab absolutely. I, I guess part of the idea I want to kind of put out there though is, and again go back to the thing of like, talk about markets, but I also talk about people. Let's talk about what's it for? Is housing for the creation of wealth or is it actually a place to live? And so, so you may be, and we, you know, we can have, we can look at numbers and say, look at all this wealth, you know, say wealth is created, but if it's use value for actual individuals for what they want to actually live a good life is is kind of diminished because 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 of their um, because of the options that they have because it, then um, is that what is that what we want is that the policy outcome that we, that we want so I guess you know so it, it's looking at it beyond just the actual what the numbers are and, and go great I can cash it in um, but I might move to a cheaper place. I mean, I can buy a lovely house in the Mallee, in Western Victoria, for 150 grand. But can I get a job there? Can, can my kids go to school, a good school there? Those kind of questions kind of come up. more, it, it, it's a 50-50 from the point of view of it's a commercial decision to 
be able to get what you want, but it's also an emotional decision versus maybe people like my parents who have several housing properties and commercial properties and they look at it from, well, if the policymakers have put in, you know, uh, all these certain benefits, well, I can just put the price up by that and then I've got other people who are interested in the property and able and willing to buy the property at that profit, or that price difference, to buy it. Because that's what my dad does. He's like, this is about dollars and cents. I don't care about anyone. When I came here, no one gave me anything. Um, there's a lot in that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm going to play the bring that up in the tutorial card at this point because there's a lot in that and that's probably an excellent kind of point to, um, and this is probably what you use your tutorials for, to open up that. And I'm not, you know, because I'm not arguing and saying, in many ways, I am simplifying things down just to work through the concept. I feel like the point that you were trying to make was that your, your housing mobility is not improved while you hang on to the asset. So you buy a simple house, you hold it for five years. Mm. That doesn't improve your position to then buy a better house or a bigger house or a house in a better location because it's also relatively moved as far away from you. Mm. If you cash your chips in, convert it to another asset, or downgrade your housing position, yeah, you're in a better position. But if it's a case of moving upwards in the housing market, you're still no better off as you held that asset. Yeah. In, in a very generalised sense. And then there's the whole, to go back to the whole real estate market, there's a, then there's the whole idea that you can um, make smart moves. You know, you will get the rough diamond and you'll flip it in five years and do that. And, and, and that's another thing that we could kind of spend a lot of time on, that how much of, what's the truth of that, how much of that is a, is a narrative, and how much of that is how many people actually successfully do that as against how many people end up um, in a lot of trouble, trying to be very clever with kind of turning over properties and all of that. But I'm, I'm not talking about that in detail today, but again, we one for the um, tutorials. So, moving into the critical kind of space, um, I'll talk a bit, I'm not going to talk about Ananya Roy today, we'll come back to her. Was anybody at the lecture last night? Any yet? Right. So I, I'm, I'm, it's like she gave me two years of a reading list for a star. I mean, you know, there's, so I'm kind of processing some amazing kind of things that I think she kind of communicated um, to a very big audience last night, it was the biggest audience I've seen there. Um, but I'll kind of, there are others kind of, kind of regarded as kind of really important thinkers in this space. Um, but I might just kind of, before we look at the critical space, let's look at the evidence. And this is something that's um, a great document that um, Raquel Romlick in her book, Urban Warfare, which is not in the library yet, but I've got them to order it because I couldn't believe, it only got released in January, but it's not in our Unimail library, but they've ordered it. So hopefully it's there soon. This is a, a I'll talk a bit about that book later. But she uncovered this, to go back to financialization, she uncovered this really important document. This is a World Bank document. And it really kind of sets the scene in terms of, um, the really dominant thinking across so many governments around the world about housing and housing policy. You can kind of pretty much kind of read it there. Governments are advised to abandon their earlier role as producers of housing and to adopt an enabling role to manage the housing sector as a whole. The fundamental shift is necessary. And really they go on and on about Remember, it's the World Bank, so a lot of it's kind of Global South kind of focus, but it's more broadly as well. This was necessary for the alleviation of poverty and for the creation of 
you know, kind of housing and affordable housing for the masses. So this 1993 kind of policy was very persuasive and very much, you look at it, it is the kind of the, it's like it's what came afterwards by that. And then, because they were already looking at what, what had been happening already. Um, and part of what they kind of, the World Bank was advising governments, all governments around the world in 1993 was, and this stuff would be very familiar, provide infrastructure for efficient residential land development. This is government's role. Balance the costs and benefits of regulation. All right? And then, and this is one we'll look at a little bit in terms of the operate, how the industry operates here in Australia. But creating greater competition in the building industry and reducing trade barriers. Reducing trade barriers. Get all that lovely cheap cladding into Australia. Yay. Look where that's left us. Um, and the other thing they talked about was strengthening institutions. And, and this is very interesting because they pay kind of lip service to or get community involved as well. But it's very much about stakeholders. Get stakeholders involved in and listen to them about creating policy. And again, we kind of go back to what stakeholders seem to be kind of like we're very kind of ready and willing and able and resourced to kind of come in and give policy advice kind of from, from the 1990s. Um, financial institutions and, for that, and um, essentially they've been a really dominant kind of force in po kind of policy kind of in this space. So I'm sure you've read the reading. The, um, it's a long book, but it's, it's a really good book. I, I just um, put the last chapter in as the reading, um, the Albers book. Um, but there's a, a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but here's a kind of what, what he talks about. He talks about housing as high quality collateral. So this is this is looking what what the impact of financialization where. I mean, in particular, and, and uh, the Burke and Hulse reading a couple of weeks ago talked about this, how the impact on Australia was maybe less, um, it was less a thing in Australia, but certainly your, your subprime prime markets and your big developers in various European markets, very much this high quality collateral of housing is very, very important. Um, the other thing he talks about, which is a, I think we've got to look very carefully about, carefully at in terms of um, where things might go in Australia, is that it ends up that equity firms actually buy public housing stock or social housing stock because efficiency and because they have money, right? So 60% of the Victorian public housing stock is more than 40 years old. Like a lot of it's in really bad nick. And, um, well, who has the money? Um, and on the other side of it is not-for-profits, social housing providers, again, coming into this space in terms of um, new financial products, not old-school kind of mortgages, but bonds. And we'll kind of touch on that a bit. The other thing he talks about, go back to Keynes, is the idea of privatised Keynesianism. So they remember this idea of Keynes, government should turn the tap on and off just to kind of balance out the kind of the different forces in the economy. Financialization has kind of seen governments go, we don't have to do that, we'll get private entities to kind of do that. We'll get private entities to build the roads. We'll get, you know, and big, big infrastructure projects will get private entities to lead the development of public housing. It's just happening. Um, a counter-argument to 
some of the critiques of financialization was this economies are growing, wages are growing. If you concentrate on wage growth, that's okay. Okay, housing become more expensive, but wages are, are grow, et cetera, et cetera. That's been just proven everywhere it hasn't worked. Okay, there's some there was some major adjustments with the GFC in certain markets where you know values of kind of homes lost in Ireland and they lost like 45, 50% in places, US, etc., big corrections. But by and large, wage growth, housing costs, massive kind of difference everywhere. So the idea of it's okay as long as things as long as we have growth, everybody can be there. It's not happening. So I guess Albers is asking the question and he comes up with a, a, a pretty clear answers. Does getting into the market deliver wealth? Well, um, again, that's a question. Um, Raquel Romnick um, from Sao Paulo. Um, as I say, this book is a really kind of detailed kind of survey of the impacts of financialization on uh, housing on property law across various parts of the world. A lot of it's based in the global south, but she also talks a lot about some of her important work was done looking at critique of what was happening in the UK um, around about kind of 2010 to 2014. She's done very good work on that. Um, but what she kind of posits uh, again in terms of um, this focus on, I guess, the impact of, of, of finance and the impacts of, of, you know, global finance on markets is that government's always there. I mean, I'm covering that in detail next week, but, you know, the idea that government is just kind of has backed away from things and let kind of market solutions happen, um, we'll, we'll look at that in, in detail and kind of maybe... Uh, critique that. And um, yeah, so what's happening in the development of new housing, especially new affordable housing, is hello financialization. We have these are both the um, National Housing Infrastructure, National Housing Investment Finance Corporation is a year old today. The Social Housing Growth Fund was an announced two and a half years ago. Because um, it's state government, they only just really started spending money in the last couple of weeks. But anyway, they got there. Um, it's, um, but this is something we'll, we'll, we'll look at and we'll go back to in terms of these kind of new products and these new ideas of like, we'll, no, government's not going to say, we'll just give you, we'll take the revenue from taxation and give you capital grants to build public housing. No, they're creating financial products to kind of do that. And again, there's something worth looking at very closely to say, what are the implications of that? Is it just about, well, that's the way to get the money to get the housing, we get the housing and people are housed? Or, is there, or are there other things that come along with it? Is there almost a kind of culture that comes along with these financial products? A set of expectations about what it is they do in terms of creating if they're involved in creating public goods. And now I'm going to show you um, Leila Farah, Ola Lali Farah. So she is the currently the UN Special Rapporteur for the Right to Adequate Housing. Um, she's a, a, a Canadian. Uh, Rekha Rolnik was her predecessor. So they're um, and essentially part of her role is, is to kind of go around the world, and, and she's been here and gone. Jeez. Um, but she's gone to other places to actually look at um, what change is happening and what, what the threats are of various drivers. And I just thought this particular TED talk really summed up a lot of things we're talking about. So. Uh, Let's give this a go. I think it will be louder. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, 
need? Ah, oh, wait. Okay. Here we are. who believe housing is a human right, not a commodity. We had spent months planning this event. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and an international network of cities had agreed to support the event. The night before the launch, I received a WhatsApp from the mayor's assistant saying that the leaders of the Catalan independence movement, all of them had been arrested and were in jail, and maybe the mayor wouldn't make it to the launch of the shift. The next morning I went to the palatial city hall in Barcelona and I was led to this incredibly regal room. And there was nothing to do but sit and wait and hope that the mayor would show up. She had every reason not to, but I was hoping she would. Because the mayor and I believe that we are at a critical moment because of the incredible disruption to housing that's happened. Housing is now viewed as an asset, a commodity, a way to grow wealth. It's not viewed as a home, a place of security, where we grow our families and share memories and stories. But it hasn't always been this way. In the 60s and 70s, housing was understood as a way to secure, to have security, personal security, but not to grow wealth. And governments were involved. They enacted legislation and policies. They wanted to create a diverse range of housing options for households of different income levels. So they made available home ownership, rental apartments, subsidized housing, public housing, homelessness, and unaffordability of housing that we see today barely existed, certainly not on today's scale. Now, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture, but I, I think housing really was viewed as a social good. And in that way, it was more closely aligned to housing as a human right, which is a place for all of us to live in dignity. Now, fast forward to 2018. Housing, or residential real estate, is now big business. In fact, it's the biggest business amounting to $163 trillion, which is more than the, it's more than double the total GDP of the entire world. And financial actors have invaded housing. Banks, pension funds, private equity firms, stockbrokers, shareholders, all of whom view housing as a place to park excess capital. And there is an abundance of excess capital. And what really worries me is that the private equity firms are preying on the misfortune and the financial ruin of families. Let me give you an example. Take Blackstone. It is the largest private equity firm in the world. They manage $100 billion of real estate. Blackstone has gone on a shopping spree. They've been buying up thousands and thousands of foreclosed homes in the US, Spain, Ireland, and the UK. They know that foreclosure creates this population that is still in need of housing. So they take these homes and they flip them and turn them into rentals. And sometimes they put them on the stock market. 
And the business model for Blackstone is that they have to keep increasing rents. Why? To satisfy their investor clients to make sure those clients get a good return on their investment. And that means pushing out lower income households and moving in more affluent ones. It's clear to me that Blackstone has as their priority their investor clients and not tenants. And that's a problem because Blackstone owns 80,000 houses and is the largest landlord in the U.S. But the commodification of housing doesn't stop there. Billionaires, individuals of ultra high net worth are also parking their money in housing. Millions of houses that are investor owned stand vacant around the world with their owners having no intention of ever stepping foot inside. Meanwhile, 100 million people are homeless worldwide. And then there's Airbnb. Corporations and investors are buying up apartment buildings and units across cities. And they're converting them in, into short-term rentals for tourists. That takes away housing supply for longer-term rentals and local residents. And where are governments in all of this? Well, they have receded from the position that they had adopted in the 60s and 70s. In fact, they're closely aligned with investors. They subsidize home ownership. They give tax breaks to investors. They lure foreign investors into their countries by waiving golden visas and citizenship. They bail out banks and financial institutions. And they're selling off social housing stock. When governments do that, they also then just leave housing to the unregulated private sector. Now, the decision to divest housing of its social value and to support the commodification of housing is not just any policy decision. It is an attack, it's a rejection of their international human rights obligations. And it's having dire consequences. The relationship now between landlords and tenants is transactional. Corporations have no qualms raising rents to unreasonable letter levels and evicting tenants for minor matters. And the influx of capital into cities is escalating the cost of housing and skyrocketing housing prices mean that those who sustain cities are being pushed out. Nurses, garbage collectors, firefighters, police officers, baristas at your local Starbucks. When I was in Northern California, the area where all those high tech firms are, many tenants came up to me and told me that their rents had doubled overnight, sending them into a kind of economic tailspin. I met people working at animation studios and in medical firms, living in tents on the sidewalk. And everywhere I go, every city I go to, I hear the same thing, whether it's Toronto or Vancouver, Sydney or Melbourne, London or Paris, Buenos Aires or Mexico City. If we want to restore human rights to people, we need a seismic shift, a shift where housing is valued as home, not equity, and where we invest in people, not capital. Surprisingly, the sector at the very center of financialization has taken a step toward this shift. The CEO of BlackRock, a rival to Blackstone, Larry Fink, 
recently wrote an open letter to the CEOs of major corporations, and in it he said, shareholder profit is not an end game. Corporations must do social good and must contribute in a positive way to society. I think Fink made some good points. But governments have a really important role to play too. They have to engage in this shift. A couple of years ago, national level governments did convene and they committed to ensuring access to adequate affordable housing for all by 2030. Now, it remains to be seen whether this is going to be a political commitment that's upheld or a broken promise. Speaking of political commitments and promises, let's go back to me sitting in Barcelona in this regal room wondering whether Mayor Calau was going to show up or not. I was having difficulty weighing these things. You know, the launch of the shift, the mayor's political allies in jail. What was going to be the priority? Well, Mayor Calau knew her priorities and she showed up. And she gave a rousing, passionate, eloquent, eloquent speech about the importance of the right to housing for people and for cities. And then she unveiled the Barcelona Manifesto, which asked cities around the world to form a network committed to housing as a human right and rejecting housing as a commodity. And it's at this city level where I am seeing some of the most impressive challenges to financialization. The city of Vancouver now has a vacant home tax, as does Paris. The city of London has a policy whereby any new buildings going up have to have a portion of affordable housing. Toronto is wrestling and trying to regulate Airbnb. A mayor in a small city in Chile stopped a luxury development because it was displacing local residents. Now you may think this is all too little, too late. But I think that these are incredibly important to stem the consequences, the disastrous consequences of financialization. You know, 1.6 billion people are living in grossly inadequate housing. This is unsustainable. I have seen people, including in affluent countries, US, Canada, Europe, living in informal settlements, in tents, in encampments, underneath highways and bridges and along railway tracks, in the harshest of conditions with no sanitation, no water, no toilets, no shower, no electricity. They are hanging by the thinnest thread. I have met mothers who have had to relinquish their children to the state because they can't afford adequate housing. I have seen children playing on heaps of garbage as if they are backyard trampolines. I have met people with disabilities living in darkened rooms at the back of a house or in homeless shelters or institutions because they and their families have no social supports. I have seen condos in the sky sell for $95 million. I have walked around ghost towns where investor capital has replaced people and homes. I have seen all of that, and I have seen more, and I don't want to see it anymore. What I want to see is for us to think twice, to think twice before we assume homelessness is caused by individual failure rather than government and societal failure. 
to think twice before we book an Airbnb on our next vacation in a city that doesn't regulate them. To think twice before we decide to buy investment property. And to think twice before we accept that governments leave housing to the unregulated private sector. What I'd like to see is for all of us, individuals, governments, corporations, to make the shift so that our actions, small or large, demonstrate our understanding that housing isn't a commodity. It's a human right. Thank you. Heartstrings pulled. Um, we're going to come back in a few weeks' time to really kind of maybe into this space, this housing as human rights space, and this space of looking at um, some of the impacts and responses of, of the housing crisis here in, in, in Melbourne. Um, but um, I thought it's important to kind of to, to be making making that connection. And I don't expect you all to kind of agree with it or feel comfortable with it, but um, I think it's important that you're kind of engaging with across the kind of spectrum of kind of ideas um, in the housing space. Oh, we're running nice and late. Great. Five minute stretch break. Is that all right? And we'll come back to uh, housing affordability measures and maybe briefly build to rent. All right. So, phone check break. Come back. Come back. 6.36.
Let's get back into it, and I might talk quicker now. Um, the thirty forty indicator. Um, you might be familiar with it. It's um, and if you're not, if you're looking in the housing space, especially in the affordable housing space, you'll need to become familiar with it because it, it's pretty much a rule of thumb. Um, and obviously it's looked at in great detail in, in the uh, reading this week. Um, I guess what I wanted to kind of run through with you is, again, to ha kind of really be in a kind of critical s space as a, uh, as a researcher as, 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 as somebody who's analyzing data when you're talking about measures of affordability or measures of housing stress or what is affordable housing and all these various kind of questions that come up. Because uh, there's a lot of different things out there and there's a lot of, you can, you can get different numbers depending on a, a lot of different detail. Um, so with the Ahuri, um, I thought I'd go, if, if you go to the Ahuri website, which I'm sure you've been going to a lot, there's a lot there, um, but if you look at the housing affordability measures, they do, they talk about the kind of two measures that they, they use in terms of the 30-40 rule, and you'll see already um, with the, with the, with the indicator that there's, two different ways to do it. So the, so the basic idea is that you've got the, you're paying more than 30% of your housing costs and in your, you're the, in the bottom 40% of um, Australia's income distribution. But what is that? And, and I just thought I'd give you one example to kind of look at to say, you know, it's not always going to give you the kind of, there's different ways to do it and it'll give you a different number. So, um, the ABS uses um, particular kind of measures for what's called equivalized um, disposable income to get a household income. So it has measures that kind of go, whether it's a couple or a couple with kids, one kid's two kids or whatever, it, you know, it, it has a, It'll use particular a particular ratio to kind of come up with the um, with, with the income, which is which will be different from the, um, the the actual gross income coming to the household. It's a different way of doing it. But there are real. But the, a lot of people say, well, equivalent disposable income it's a better measure. But I just pulled this thing off the Ahuri website just as as an example of how. Actually, some of the outcomes are quite perverse in terms of measures. So you've got, if you have a couple, a household that's made up of a couple of two people, 
Um, and you've only got one income earner. And this is all based on 70 grand a year. Because they're on 70 grand a year and they kind of hit into a um, higher tax bracket, their um, after tax income, which is then part of the measure, is um, 55,703. If you have a couple who are on 70 grand, like between them, and this notion is they both own 35 grand. They both own 35 grand a year. How much tax do you pay at 35 grand a year? Well, not a lot, even as a couple. Huh? So, they have more money kind of coming in after tax. So, on that basis, um, one is in the measure, one isn't in the measure in terms of um, affordable housing. So that's a, I mean, that's a, a, a good example of how the measure can come up with, with different outcomes. But if you think about that, if you're using the measure of household income, just gross tax or income, you're going to get a completely different outcome. So I just thought I'd kind of put that up and says, look at the, kind of have a look at the detail, it's all very easy to find, and have a look at the variance on there, just even in that measure of how many people are in what's called um, housing stress. So that's even before we get to what we talk about, in, in, get to in, in the Baker paper, which, is, which then kind of actually critiques you know, it's in, in quite a lot of other detail. So, um, this is, uh, I mean, Emma Baker of an University of South, is University of South Australia, does kind of great work in this space. Rebecca Bentley's here in, in Melbourne, um, and she's um, a really kind of excellent kind of resource in terms of the, the kind of the, where health and housing kind of, kind of meet. Um, um, so she's somebody to look out for. You might have come across her. I don't know if she teaches much into this program. But what they're saying in their paper is sometimes the household affordability stress indicator is just using a 30% indicator, just 30% of income. Um, you know, it's, it's still kind of quite commonly used because it's easier to do. But with that, there's some real weaknesses in it. The idea that some people choose, if they're on a higher income, they actually choose to pay a lot of rent, or they choose to have a high mortgage. Well, because, yes, if you are on, if you do have a $150,000 income, and you're paying 45% of your income on, on rent or a mortgage, you can still afford good cheese you know, etc. a nice wine, or holidays. If you're on a low income, it may be the difference between, you know, whether you're, whether you're eating well, whether you have money for kind of new shoes, those kind of basic things. Um, also, that basic indicator is weak in terms of, doesn't take into account household size and competition, composition, and, and that, that, that's very important, and I think Breaking that down, that's really important in terms of what we're looking at in terms of actually not just income, but also kind of what, what it means to the income, who's in the household, you know, are there children in the household, etc. And there's arguments made against it which they say that it's arbitrary. I mean, it's, it's actually not arbitrary, it's pretty, 30% is, is a pretty good measure. Um, but I won't, because I'm conscious of time, I'm not going to kind of talk too much about You'll see in the paper they they also kind of critique the the kind of basic kind of measure that's used, um, both in terms of so the gradient issue is about the idea of like slippage, how people kind of can be there or not there, and what's the difference if they're thirty one percent or it's twenty nine percent? Does that really matter? And um, 
and also what you're capturing with it with a single at a single kind of point in time and what you're eating. So the paper is kind of quite detailed in looking at that, but they were quite kind of clever in what they did because they used the Hilda survey, which again, if you're not aware of it, it's actually produced in the University of Melbourne. It's a very important longitudinal kind of study of really in great detail the kind of how people live and what people do, etc. And um, it gives a it, it's a really really rich data set. And they kind of used five years of data um, to try to look at, well, who's actually coming under this affordability and not, aff not affordability kind of measure. And uh, what they found is that there is really two groups. The slippers are people who, for whom it might be an isolated experience and but there can be quite a significant percentage of those kind of measured as you know living in unaffordable housing and there's a real risk of that there's a policy risk in that in terms of like if policy is driven by kind of response to people who are having you know a single kind of you know, or an occasional over five, ten years problem problem with housing, a problem with income related to housing, then um, is that actually a good a good point of intervention? And the important thing that um, the paper kind of points out is this idea of stickers. So these are people. What what they found is, and I think it's a very kind of powerful correlation between, because the Hilda survey tells you a lot about how people live, how people, people's health, people's employment, etc., etc. And I found a really strong correlation between the data about people who live in public housing in Australia, which is um, data that's collected by the Australian Institute of Family Studies from memory. Um, there's a lot of data there that tells you who they are, and what is their, you know, what is their situation in life? And this found through the Hilda survey that people who had continuously, over five years, been, you know, had housing affordability issues, were also more likely to be strongly likely to be have persistent low incomes, have health issues, be living with a disability, and significantly not likely to be working or working kind of um, very often and whatever. But what they also found was, it's really obvious because we have this so, such a low prevalence of social housing in Australia, but I think it's really important to identify is most of those people aren't living in social housing. They're either living in, significantly living in private rental housing or some of them are living in that, you know, they have, they, um, uh, they have more. They have mortgages. So, what the paper does is really present a challenge to to policymakers in terms of what is your focus here. If you've got a problem with housing affordability and you want to do interventions, do you know how do you know what's your what's your kind of um, who's first, who should be first? And whose job is it? If if the cohort of the stickers is just like the public housing cohort, do you just say, well, that's obviously that's state government, that's public housing. You just need more, more public housing because that's already their job to kind of be that for the people most in need. And all those other questions. What I thought I'd do is just kind of mention kind of to get into the real world of this rather than academic papers and talking about numbers or whatever. Um, in the last couple of years, um, part of the work I've been involved in in local government is we've been doing some, trying to get some kind of deeper kind of research into, into housing need and housing supply so that we in local government um, can be most effective with what we have, which is not a lot, but 
you know, uh, I'm in a local government that's at a, at a policy level is saying recognises the housing crisis, has its kind of narrative, is like the Lani Farah, housing is a human right, etc. But we're going to go, well, how do we know what we should do, how we should do it? Um, this is um, the Home and Moreland Report, which is done by um, ID Consulting. So ID Consulting are a very significant entity in the housing space and the urban space because basically they do and produce stats and produce the kind of the, I guess, the uh, presentation of stats for the, almost the majority of local governments in, in Australia. So their, um, their analysis, um, their, their tools that they use to actually present information or how they break down information is quite influential. And um, so we, you know, and, but with this work, and they're great people, they're really smart, but we really try to push them hard to say, no, nah, deeper, deeper, answer better questions. But, um, so, it's just an example here of, and we wanted numbers. We wanted to say, well, how many people are in unaffordable housing right now? And who are they? And we came up with these, um, with these numbers. And we identified that based on 2016, there was about 4,000, and we're going to have 7,000 by um, 2036. So, I mean, that seemed like a good number, you know, in terms of um, housing need. I mean, you know, we've only got 65,000 households, so what can we do about that? Um, it actually presents a huge challenge because um, it means that 18% of new housing for the next 20 years has got to be affordable housing. And um, we're trying to work out how to do that. Um, but the, um, just to talk about the kind of measure that they use, so I've got to talk about that, is they made an assumption. They, they use, and they use data again, kind of supported by some work in Monash, this will work here in, in, in the Hilda survey. They actually made an assumption that half of the people who are currently living in unaffordable housing will not be living in unaffordable housing in a year's time. So they basically came, got the number and halved it. And we talked to them a lot about this and kind of going, is that good data? Is that good number? Is it, you know? And we ended up kind of agreeing with them that it's probably not a bad way to break it down at this point because we, we, we don't really know. So that's how we came up with the figure. Um, the other thing to remember about housing, housing numbers is, and we'll talk in detail kind of in later kind of lectures around the new measures that the government have have kind of put in place so the new the new legislation that defines affordable housing by income measures and location and types of housing but you've got to do the other side as well you've got to make um, you can say um, you've got to actually price housing and the government um, the government in defining affordable housing um, last year and they introduced this um, in, in last year basically said, legislation is, prohibits us from actually putting a price on housing and say affordable housing is this price point, this price point, this price point. And it still doesn't make sense to me, but they argue that we, they weren't going to do it. So it's actually up to who? Is it up to local governments? Is it up to private developers? Is it up to social housing providers? It's up to somebody to actually work out what the assumptions are around what's affordable especially when you're talking about um, purchase. It presents some particular challenges. <coughs> you know, 5.24%? Sounds a bit high now, doesn't it? You know, that number has come up last year, but maybe it isn't high for people with getting a low doc loan. I don't know, but I think most people are getting, you know, at least fixed for, for you know, a few years when they get a new loan. Um, 30 years deposit, is it always a 30 year loan? Depends on the age. 
as I've kind of told you in early lectures, I recently bought my first property in my life. I can't get a 30-year loan, I'm too old. They only gave me 22 years. Um, you know, and so there are those variables in there as well. And then there are variables, policy variables, like stamp duty, goes policy, budget by budget, the different things you're trying to change. So you've got to tread very carefully when you're looking at what defines affordability, the price of it. There are, there are a hell of a lot of variables. And I'll briefly just talk to, go to the other big player in the housing affordability measure market at this point. And, and essentially what's happening at the moment, especially in you know, probably across Victoria, but certainly in metro, in metro local governments is because the state governments introduced a definition of affordable housing and made affordable housing an object of the uh, Planning and Environment Act, and kind of put the message out saying we want all local governments to kind of play a part and come up with kind of what the need is. So we can, if we have population growth, we can also have, you know, a spread of new affordable housing. So there's, there's basically ID and the SGS uh, Economics and Planning are the two big players in the defining housing need game at the moment. And um, so I just pulled this out of the report. We haven't released this publicly. It's all right, they're using it for everybody else as well. But this number, so here's the um, ID number. And they come up with these numbers. Significantly higher, saying actually the current need is, you know, in Moreland, affordable housing is, well, be, you know, 8,000 something now. And it's going to be that by 2036. Um, and there is great rigor in their methodology as well. It's incredibly complicated. I'll just show you a bit of it. That's a little bit of talking about the, how they've got a baseline. But they've, um, they've developed co the concept of determined households in need of assistance. So this is the idea that try to find a measure of if people, for people who do not have affordable housing, because basically they can't afford it. I mean, there needs to be, notionally, there needs to be some kind of subsidy or intervention there to give them housing that, that's um, affordable based on, based on their income and their situation. So they've come up with that concept. And it's, um, it, it baffles my mind, I'll just, you know, in terms of the, how they do it. But, the, you know, this is just one part of the process what they do with Table Builder in um, using ABS stats. You know, it's, it's incredibly complex and they've kind of like got four kind of levels of it to, to get to those numbers. Um, so just introduce the idea of like numbers about housing need stats and then the cost of housing, what is, what is the price of affordable housing is a thing you have to tread in very kind of carefully and kind of know what are the assumptions there and um, what is the dead telling you about um, what the need is? I haven't lot, got a lot of time to talk about build to rent. I thought I'd just, yeah, bring it up in terms of both financialization, planning, essentially, You'll see there's a short reading this week about built rent that basically says that the, it's taxation is the main inhibitor for a built to rent market in, in Australia. Um, and I wanted to kind of challenge that a bit to say kind of is that the only inhibitor um, for built rent or on the other side of it is what do we actually want to see if there's generally this this liking of this concept that um, we have a product a, a, a in, in the market that's 
essentially rather than individual uh, apartments and houses being rented out, but especially apartments, that um, it's something on the similar lines to it's owned in a similar kind of way to a office building or a shopping mall or whatever. It's owned by those kind of institutions or maybe specialist institutions that do with it. What's the... Um, uh, what do we kind of want to see in that? Because a lot of the focus in the policy discussion has been about uh, the incentives are for individual investors, so we need to change the incentives. And that kind of makes sense. We need to, to, we need to or we need to look at the, um, the rules that kind of inhibit super funds from getting involved. Because built rent, if built rent's never going to give you more than, you know, if you can't make it give you more than 5% yield, then super funds can't play because they need to get 6 to 8% and those kind of things. Those kind of arguments are kind of there. But is that the only argument that we need to be kind of looking at in terms of built rent? And I'd probably go back to financialization and back to um, later. The Lani Farah's kind of discussion around what's been happening in other places in terms of the institutional kind of involvement of um, entities that are maybe not even based in, in this country um, and are dealing with things on a very kind of wide scale. I'll just put it out there, does it matter? So we look at a way to kind of look at it, and I just want to introduce this idea now that we have Terry's bigger map. Um, urban form. It's a planning question. So built to rent kind of says it is apartments. It's high density. It's kind of kind of goes hand in hand, probably like that. So a question got asked of me at some point, somebody rang me up. Can't remember who. I kind of went, I'm about to go into a meeting with the state government and I've been asked to talk about build to rent and, and I'm not sure what local government has got anything to do with it. Like has it got anything to do with planning? I said, No, I don't know, has it? Well, it does. Like, do you incentivize built to rent? Can you put that into a the Victorian planning planning scheme to say a built to rent product is advantaged as against a speculative built product? These kind of things. Um, what's happening with obviously financial system? So is this, a, is this a new kind of transfer that we're going to create? We already have transfers happening. We'll talk about that a bit next week. Transfers happening in terms of negative gearing and capital gains tax and, and different things. There, there are kind of transfers happening in that space. Is, it, is this creating a social or kind of public good whereby it's good policy to create a new kind of transfer? or benefit to big corporations because of the benefit they're giving to society? That's a question you ask. Um, uh, income and wealth distribution. Well, does it, how much is, a lot of the discussion about built to rent is, um, can it be affordable? And how would it be affordable? And it, it, so, if it's not affordable, why does it matter? Why should there? Why should anybody kind of care if it happens? It's just it's just the mar market kind of doing its thing. It's just a kind of new. It's a new form of kind of financing, a new form of building management. Or again, do we want to uh, create? Is there a way to actually create products <coughs> as? Folks like Rob Pradlin have been kind of arguing. Um, 
that you can create a kind of product which is like a new national rental affordability scheme whereby you can provide below market rents and therefore there is a benefit there and then what, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve, do you want people to then be able to have pay less rent so they can save to buy? Which is another model we could talk about at another point, like the assemble model, which is the rent to buy model, which is just kind of emerging. Everybody heard of that? You all heard of that? It's very, everybody knows about that thing. All right, might talk about that. I see anybody getting Chris Daff in. Oh, maybe it's a bit too late. Um, But the other thing that's, well, we're going to kind of capture it. One of the arguments is that says, if big institutions are, are actually holding on to buildings, they're going to build them better and they're going to look after them better. Well, that's very attractive in the current environment, given that the nightmare looks like we're facing in terms of all the poor buildings that have been built in the last 20 years. You know. Is that a benefit? But would that be true? What we know about the entities like that have been developed by financialization. At some stage, are you, are you going to sort of cover the hierarchy of planning with respect to national to state to local and as local government, the potential levers you have to preference one style of development over another, or like you just talked about, potentially quality of building mm. uh, or management quality of building that goes over and above the national code. Mm. I don't have any sort of sense of the hierarchy of jurisdiction. Sure, no, absolutely. Um, that will be do, 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 do. two weeks away. Okay. I'll get into the planning space and talk about that. No, I think, it, I think it's very important and I've been a bit in two minds because I'm thinking maybe I left that too late in the semester but you know, live and learn, but we will be looking at that, and I think it's it brings us very important questions about where the where the kind of levers are, and where the drivers are for change, especially in terms of design. And so we'll have um, Michael's coming as developer that week, but also we'll be talking about that probably as well. I think the following week with Alexa Garros coming in, we're talking about the relationship with design and um, the actual structure of the industry, um, incentives for kind of improvements, those kind of things. So uh, that interplay between what gets built and, and the planning scheme is, is something that we're gonna, we are going to cover. So hopefully that will answer some of those questions. So I think with me running out of time this week to kind of cover that anymore, I just want to kind of maybe leave that with you in terms of starting to think about models of housing production, models of housing consumption, the relationship of finance to them, the relationship of the, the managerial kind of space, which is the government of kind of policy space, and how these all kind of interact. And I thought, interesting, and I think rent, uh, built to rent is a really good example of that. And, but the discussion so far, if you kind of go look at the discussion, it's, it, it, it's been very kind of largely quite simplistic. And um, we need more kind of complex and integrated kind of policy settings to really kind of solve these kind of problems. Um, and it might be very easy for government, and I, I feel it's coming in the next budget, I talk about a sense in state government that they'll they'll announce some thing and they'll have for build to rent, and it might be just one kind of, it's an incentive, it's a financial incentive, but the question is though, is that what what's that going to bring? Does it bring kind of what benefits it's going to bring? What risks does it have? Something to think about. All right, I've run late. Well, I'm officially late, but I said I'd finish five past every week, and I'll now run to 7.09. Um, so next week is all about government and um, 
we'll try to kind of cover that off and then we'll um, be into kind of more themed kind of space after that from about week six. And hope you all get you your tutorials. All the tutors are going to be talking to you about some new resources that the library have kind of created to kind of support your assignment writing uh, this semester. We're just finalizing that and putting it up live so that um, but the tutors will be talking to you about that this week. Hopefully uh, help you with finding things and give you examples in terms of uh, how to approach the especially assignment one. Alrighty. Over and out. Oh, I keep forgetting to put that on. Oh yeah, this thing's happening. It looks really good on Friday. I've actually got people who live in the place talking about living in the place. It's really rare in housing policy discussions. I'll be there. Oh, good. I'm Holly. Hi, Holly. Senator, come say hi. Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you. Mm. Um, that lecture was great, but also really annoying.
appreciate